under the shadow of the Almighty. In Psalms 91 verse 1, the Bible shares, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. The Almighty is Jesus Christ. It's amazing to see in nature object lessons from the Bible. Just as we are to be under the wings of the Almighty, our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, you can see in nature a similar principle being taught to us. Look how this swan is taking care of her little ones. And again, you can see a protective parent with his little ones literally embedded underneath her feathers. You see, there is protection. There is a sense of safety. Do you Feel the need to be safe under the wings of our Heavenly Father. How can we be under the wings of Almighty Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour? The Bible tells us in Psalm 91 verse 4 that our God is is our shield and buckler. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. When we're under the wings of the Almighty, we can trust the Lord. In Ruth 2.12 it states, The Lord recompense thy work and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust under the wings of the almighty we are the apple of god's eye in psalm 17 verses 7 to 9 the bible reads show thy marvelous loving kindness o thou that savest by thy right hand them which put their trust in thee from those that rise up against them keep me as the apple of the eye hide me under the shadow of thy wings, from the wicked that oppress me, from my deadly enemies who compass me about. When we're under the wings of the Almighty, we can see loving kindness. In Psalm 36 verse 7, the Bible reads, How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God! Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. The word loving kindness is a most beautiful word to describe the true character of our living God in heaven. When we think of being under the wings of the Almighty, we can only think of the salvation in Jesus Christ. Jesus, who was on this earth for 33 and a half years, wooing man to submit to his will, to surrender to his Holy Spirit, to choose to follow the way and the path of Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. It was the same Jesus who endured persecution and mockery from his own brethren. And Jesus looked in the future knowing that in AD 70, the Romans, would destroy Jerusalem and he would recognize that the Jewish nation had rejected the cornerstone of the building and this is why Jesus you can imagine in tears in emotion in pain saying, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not? 
Can you imagine the pain that Jesus went through? The nation whom he built, remember, that God led the children of Israel out of Egypt. Moses was the voice piece of the people. It was Moses that saw God by faith at the top of Mount Sinai and received the tables of stone upon which God wrote the Ten Commandments. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, and you recognise, well, who was in that cloud that led the children of Israel from out of Egypt? You'll recognise it was no other than Jesus Christ. It was the Son of God that was teaching the children of Israel his way and his laws. It was the Son of God that gave Moses the sanctuary plan of how to build an earthly sanctuary, which was a pattern after the heavenly sanctuary. It was Jesus Christ that also gave Moses instruction with regard to all of the ceremonial laws. You see, the ceremonial laws were to point to the sacrifice of Christ. It was to point to the day when the Messiah should come and surrender his life on the cross on our behalf because of our sins. You see, the sanctuary pointed to Jesus Christ in all aspects. Even when you look at the furnishings within the sanctuary, you would see it pointed to the Son of God, to Jesus. For example, whenever you think about the table of showbread, didn't Jesus say, I am the bread of life? When you think about the candlestick, the seven branch candlestick, which was kept alight by the oil, the olive oil, didn't Jesus say, I am the light of the world? When you think about the Ark of the Covenant, which contained the Ten Commandments, which was written by the finger of God, didn't Jesus say, I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill? And isn't Jesus a walking, living example of the Ten Commandments? So you see, it was Jesus that built the Jewish nation. And now the Jewish nation was rejecting Christ. How could that be? You see, when we think of wings, they represent protection, trust, loving kindness and the salvation of God. But not only that. But wings can also represent healing and restoration. In Malachi 4.2, the Bible reads, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go forth and grow up as calves of the storm. Jesus will redeem us from this planet, and over time, God will bring us back to our original height that we had lost since the Garden of Eden. Did you know that Adam and Eve were at least two times the height of men today? But over time, mankind has degenerated. But when Jesus returns, he will restore us and he will complete his healing through us. What a wonderful time it will be. The creation reveals the love of God for mankind. In Genesis 1 verses 27 to 29, the Bible reads, So God created man in his own image. How so? Well, not only did man reflect God in physical likeness, but also man reflected God in character, both male and female. The Bible says, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply. You see, it has always been God's plan for mankind to be fruitful, to have children, to multiply. It's because God loves us supremely. And he would fit every individual in heaven if we were all willing to be with Christ. 
throughout all eternity in heaven. Jesus loves life. Jesus is pro-life. And the Bible says in verse 28, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it. So we need to look after this earth, this planet. Well beyond climate change, we need to take care of all that God has given us in this planet. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And what did God say in verse 29? Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding to you it shall be for meat yielding seed to you it shall be for meat the word meat in this context means food coming from the original word okla god catered for the needs of mankind when you have a car that tells you that you should put petrol in it what happens if you were to put in diesel wouldn't there be problems? The same God that created our human incredible body. The Bible says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. The same God knew exactly the food types that would be best for us. Every herb bearing seed and every tree that yielded fruit. It was a diet of fruits, nuts, seeds that would maintain optimum health for our original parents but also for us today you see god created us for his pleasure because in revelation 4 11 it says thou art worthy o lord to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created did you get that whoever is listening to this message recognize you are beloved of God. You are loved so much that he gave you his son to die for your sins. Not just you, but for every human being that has ever lived on this earth. And when he made you, you were his pleasure. You are his pleasure. And he wants you to remain to be his pleasure through all eternity. Listener. You're loved. Never forget that. And that same love applies to all of his sons and daughters on this planet. He loves us. But God hates the sin. You see, God created us for his pleasure. God created us in his image. God created us to multiply and populate the world. God loves his creation. And the same God that loves us wishes us to prosper and to be in good health. In 3 John 2, God states, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. What point is it, beloved, if you prosper in this world, but you don't have good health? And conversely, you can have good health, but if you're not prospering, especially spiritually, what profit is that? God wants us to have holistic health. He wants us to have physical health, mental health, spiritual health, emotional health and social health. If we have all these things, our soul will indeed prosper. When you think of the Garden of Eden, it gives us today a template of optimum health. You can summarize optimum health in two words using the acronym new start. New start. You see, N is for nutrition. And God gave Adam and Eve her bearing seed and fruit of the tree, according to Genesis 1, 29. God gave exercise for Adam and Eve to dress the Garden of Eden and to keep it. Genesis 2.15. God gave Adam and Eve water because there was a river that went out of Eden that split into four, according to Genesis 2, verse 10.
God gave Adam and Eve sunlight. In Genesis 1.16, the sun is the greater light that rules the day. God also gave temperance guidelines. In Genesis 2, verse 16 and 17, God said, you can eat of every tree, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. God gave us fresh air. In Genesis 1, 8, the Bible says that God called the firmament heaven, i.e. the sky. And it was never tainted with chemtrails. God also gave rest, physical rest, as well as spiritual rest. And then after God created the world in six days, on the seventh day, he rested on the seventh day. Genesis 2, 2. That cycle has never changed, the seven day cycle. Have you ever wondered where the seventh day or the seven day cycle came from? You see, whenever we talk about a day, a 24 hour day, we recognize that what? A 24 hour day is when the earth spins around on its own axis. When we think of a month, we recognize that the moon goes around the earth in a lunar month. When we think about a year, we think about the earth that goes around the sun. But when we think about the week, can somebody explain that one to me using the same examples? We can't because the cycle of seven days comes directly from the beginning at creation as per the word of God. And he rested on the seventh day, Adam and Eve. And it leads on to the most important health element of New Start, and that's T, trusting God. God blessed them. God blessed Adam and Eve. Genesis 1, 28. Adam and Eve had everything that they needed. They weren't just merely created beings. They weren't just merely son, a son and daughter of God. They were like kings. They were like <laughs> monarchs. God gave them everything, but yet, sadly, they were tempted into sin. In order for us to have restoration, beloved, we also need to have a new start in our lives. Are you willing to take that opportunity? God heals disease. Who healeth all thy diseases? In Psalm 103, verse 2 and 3, the Bible says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Are you experiencing the benefits of God today? Absolutely. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth how much of our diseases? All thy diseases. In Matthew 9, verse 35, Bible states, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people what a compassionate loving savior he is in exodus 15:26, as god had led the children of israel from out of egypt and god was training israel in the wilderness in preparation to access the earthly Canaan, which was rich and fertile. That would be a, a tremendous blessing for the children of Israel once they settled there. But God warned them and he made it very clear that he heals as we obey him. The Bible says, if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. You see, the reason why the Egyptians had so much disease, the reasons why today in modern spiritual Egypt, as it were, 
there is so much disease is because we're not diligently hearkening to the voice of God. We're not doing that which is right in his sight. We're not giving ear to his commandments, his ten commandments, which includes the seventh day Sabbath that begins from Friday sunset and finishes Saturday sunset. The only way we can obtain full restoration and be cleansed from all disease and sin is by returning to God, listening to his voice and by God's grace, keeping his commandments. Didn't Solomon say in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, verse 13 and 14, fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. We can never find a more better way. To live in this life. In fact, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. What does the Bible state regarding the diseases of Egypt? Of Egypt, the Bible gives us some very good examples. In Deuteronomy 7, verse 14 to 16, it states, Thou shalt be blessed above all people. There shall not be male or female barren among you. In other words, you'll have plenty of children or among your cattle in other words your animals will also have plenty of young ones verse 15 and the lord will take away from thee all sickness and will put none of the evil diseases of egypt which thou knowest upon thee but will lay them upon all them that hate thee and thou shalt consume all the people which the Lord thy God shall deliver thee, thine eye shall have no pity upon them, neither shalt thou serve their gods, for that will be a snare unto thee. Notice that warning. Do not serve any other gods made of gold and silver. Do not serve mankind. God is calling us to serve him and him alone. But notice the diseases of Egypt is as, a, is as a direct result because they did the opposite of God's will. We have the choice today to choose God and do that which is right and allow him to work through us to be righteous through him. You see, when we think about the drugs of Egypt, they do not cure. And the Bible gives us some very interesting examples. Even though in Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse 12, it was not in reference necessarily to Egypt, but the principle is the same. Asa, a key influential figure. In the 30 and ninth year of his reign as a king, was diseased in his feet until his disease was exceeding great. Yet in his disease, he sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians. Here we go. How many of us, when we're sick, exclude God and go directly to the so-called people that are supposed to heal us? This is opposite to how God would have us today. When we are sick, the first point of contact should be Christ himself. And then Christ will lead us to do those things or to those who can help us to be restored back into good health. But how often do we place mankind above God? In Jeremiah chapter 46, verse 10 and 11, we're told for this is the day of the Lord God of hosts, a day of vengeance that he may avenge him of his adversaries and the sword shall devour and it shall be satiate and made drunk with their blood. For the Lord God of hosts hath a sacrifice in the north country by the river Euphrates, which kingdom lived, literally was positioned on the river Euphrates in the north country. It was Babylon. And today there is a modern spiritual Babylon that emulates the same old Babylon. A Babylon that's built on self and refuses to listen to the voice of God. The Bible continues, go up into Gilead and take balm, O virgin, the daughter of Egypt. In vain 
shalt thou use many medicines, for thou shalt not be cured. You can use as many medicines as you want, but when you exclude God from your life, there is no guarantee of your cure. There is healing only through Jesus Christ. You see, today we can see the following verse coming into fruition more and more. In Revelation 18, verse 23, we see nations are deceived by sorceries. The Bible says, And the light of a candle shall come no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth. Take note of that. Thy merchants, tradesmen, businessmen, the super wealthy were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. So here we can see an accumulation of wealth, but not spread across the world evenly. Oh no. There are merchants who are described as great men of the earth. And sadly, them, together with many others, are deceived by sorcery what is sorcery let's so what are sorceries let's have a look at the concordance in thayer's definition on the left hand side we can see number one it means the use or the administering of drugs note that drugs number two poisoning can you see the connection drugs poisoning do drugs Poison, beloved. Number three, sorcery, magical arts, often found in connection with idolatry and fostered by it. Number four, metaphorically, the deceptions and seductions of idolatry, including spiritualism. And if you look at the Strong's definition, it clearly states sorceries mean medication, i.e., pharmacy that is magic sorcery witchcraft do drugs deceive beloved can drugs alter our state of consciousness is it true that when we take drugs it sometimes can have side effects you see pharmacy and pharmaceutical are derived from the Greek words pharmakia, pharmakios, pharmakos, pharmakon. It means the same thing, sorcery or poisoner. Today's drugs do not cure, just like the old drugs of Egypt. In a quote written well over a hundred years ago from Disease and Its Causes, chapter three, health or how to live from page 177 it states but no credit should be allowed the drugs taken for they only hindered nature in her efforts all the credit shall be ascribed to nature's restorative powers did you know that god has given you a most wonderful immune system aren't we fearfully and wonderfully made beloved you see, physicians, by administering their drug poisons, how interesting. Did we not look at the definition of sorceries? Drug poisons have done very much to increase the depreciation of the race, physically, mentally and morally. More deaths have been caused by drug taking than from all other causes combined. Drugs never cure disease. They only change the form and location. You see, there is a vaccination agenda. Vaccines, they're just another drug, but they're super drugs because their effects are far more detrimental than some of the over-the-counter drugs that we can get from the pharmacy today. And I want to share a few things with you that's highly concerning. What is a vaccine? 
and why was it used? What is, what is a vaccine and why was it used? Well, we're told that the word vaccinate comes from the word vaca or cow in some languages. That's what a cow is, vaca. It means to inoculate with the cowpox or a virus originally taken from cows called vaccine matter. Vaccinated means inoculated with the cowpox. Vaccinating means inoculating with the cowpox. <laughs> you see, originally the vaccine came as a result of interactions with cows. In fact, if you go back to 1976, we're told that the smallpox vaccine was introduced by Edward Jenner. And it was the first successful vaccine to be developed. He observed that milkmaids who previously had caught cowpox did not catch smallpox and showed that inoculated vaccinia protected against the inoculated variola virus. So obviously the milkmaids were milking the cows and they would catch smallpox. But with this smallpox vaccine, it helped to alleviate the problem. Now, my comment would be this vaccine was relatively innocent. You know, it was literally um, to inoculate the cow. They took elements accordingly and placed it in the injection so that we would create antibodies. But hey, if you've got a very strong immune system, if you have a virus or a bacteria that comes into you, your body will fight and it will produce its own antibodies for you. But all I'm going to say is the smallpox vaccine was more innocent back in that day. However, when we look at the modern vaccines, there's plenty of room for concern. Let's explore a few examples. Before we do, right now, the world is in a crisis. Wuhan, China, thousands of people have died. And we're told that this is the result of obtaining the coronavirus. What's interesting is that there are many questions. Some people are saying, did the virus really just come from the Wuhan market? Or did it come from a licensed laboratory? where they were experimenting in the laboratories and testing certain biochemicals or bioweapons. People have asked a question. It seems strange, coincident, that 5G, as you can see right here, 5G, just in the bottom left corner, was prevalent in Wuhan. In fact, it was one of the key cities used or test cities used to roll out 5G. Most of you may have internet speed, um, may have internet connections of 2.5 gigahertz or maybe even five gigahertz. But 5G can be up to 60 gigahertz. And many people have seen adverse effect to health when within the millimeter waves, when within the influence of this frequency. Is it a coincidence? You decide. We have to ask ourselves the question. Many people would normally have a dry cough following a high level fever. In this particular case, there was a lady whose temperature had gone up to 39.3 degrees Celsius, that's, that's high. Her cough doesn't have any phlegm. She has trouble breathing. She needs to take big, big breaths just to walk and feels fatigue all over. Does this sound like a normal virus to you? Have you not seen videos of people falling flat on their faces in China? Is there something more to this? You decide. Well, 
the Christian Post highlighted on the 17th of February 2020. As the death toll climbs, China blames the US for coronavirus causing panic. How so? Well, as coronavirus cases and deaths spike in China, communist officials have attempted to deflect blame away from the central Chinese government by accusing the United States of both starting the virus and causing panic in its response to the outbreak, according to a human rights outlet. So you see, there is a lot of concern in the world in regard to how this coronavirus started. Is anybody brave enough out there to tell the truth? There's big discussions all around, of course. Many people are trying to find a solution to the coronavirus and there are many who are pointing to vaccination. But you'll notice on the 25th of February, this year, 2020, we're told religious vaccine exemption bill sparks debate across the United States. In a recent um, uh, study, we're told, that more than 88% of adults support requiring healthy children to receive vaccines in order to attend school. But then you've also got another group that feel that by enforcing such a measure, it goes against their beliefs and there is an anti-vaccination group. So what should happen? Should everybody have mandatory vaccines? Or should, be, or should everybody have the opportunity to decide for themselves and especially parents to decide on behalf of their children? What do you think? On the Sun Journal, we're told opting out of vaccination should not be an option. It says, if you were to conduct a public survey as to whether respondents through a terrorist should be criminally prosecuted, convicted and punished for spraying an aerosol can of dangerous pathogens in a school building, you'd probably get a nearly unanimous affirmative response. Well, on Tuesday, and this is um, going back to the 1st of March, Maine's voters will be asked in a referendum if it's acceptable to allow parents to send their unvaccinated children, the human equivalent of aerosol cans, into the state school building to spray pathogens by sneezing, coughing or exhaling, so long as they have philosophical or religious reasons for doing so. You see, there's a big storm. There are people telling us that we should have vaccination, but there are others who want to exercise their own freedom by saying no. Why would not everybody accept a vaccination? Is vaccination the cure for coronavirus and for many other diseases in the world today? Even in Germany, on the 2nd of March 2020, we're told that measles vaccination becomes mandatory in that country, according to Euronews. You've even got the President of the United States of America emphasizing the importance to get measles shots. What's this leading to? We're then told on the 3rd of February this year, 2020, the US military are working to develop coronavirus vaccine. Why would the military be working on developing a coronavirus vaccine? Isn't this a health issue? Shouldn't this be with the doctors and the medical specialists? Why would Pentagon, why would the American military want to be working on a vaccine? Is it for health or is it simply another form of a bio weapon? You decide. In stat, shockingly, we're told that a global vaccine coalition group unveils ambitious plan to immunize 300 million children. Why? Back in August the 29th, 2019, Gavi 
The Vaccine Alliance has unveiled an ambitious plan to expand the number of doses it helps developing countries purchase, aiming to vaccinate an additional 300 million children from 2021 to 2025. The CEO of the Vaccine Alliance is Dr. Seth Berkeley. Notice it's not talking about children across the whole world. It's talking about children in developing countries. Is this fair? Why would the Vatican be involved in encouraging vaccination? According to the Catholic News Service, 20th of March 2019, the Vatican's Academy for Life encourages parents to vaccinate children. Doesn't this sound so odd to you? that the military and the Vatican are involved in the question of vaccination? You may remember back in 25th of September 2015, for the first time, the Pope of Rome addressed the assembly in the United Nations headquarters in New York. This Pope is no ordinary Pope. This Pope is a Jesuit Pope. And Pope Francis invites religious, political leaders to sign a global pact. What is this global pact about? Again, the Vatican urged to partner with top population controllers on Pope's global education pact. And here in this picture, you can see uh, on the left, Bishop Marcelo Sanchez Sorondo with Jeffrey Sachs on the right. We're told a key means of population control for Sachs and several potential funders is education. It is also the preferred method of population control for Bishop Marcelo Sanchez Sorondo, Chancellor of the Vatican Academy, where the announcement was made. Is this saying that the Pope is in favor of population control? And what does that mean, population control? What kind of control are we talking about? Isn't it alarming that the CDC, Center of the, um, the Disease Control Unit, admits that 98 million Americans received a polio vaccine in an eight year span when it was contaminated with cancer virus? Let me ask you a question. Do you think that was an accident? Or if that was pre-planned? What would you expect if you receive a vaccination with a cancer virus? Isn't the likelihood that you would actually get cancer? I asked the question again. Are vaccines designed to protect us with good health? Or are they being used as a weapon against humanity? There's a case. And there are many Indians that are not very pleased with Bill Gates. His name is synonymous with Windows, computers and software. Paralysis cases spike in wake of Bill Gates polio vaccination effort in India. Gavi, the Global Alliance for vaccines and immunizations were blamed for recommending, and watch this, untested. Did you see that? Untested. And I just need to highlight this. Untested polio vaccines. Look at that. Untested polio vaccines. Why would you give a vaccine to an individual without it being tested? Can you accidentally do that? Or is this deliberate? India holds Bill Gates accountable for his vaccine crimes. You see the Gates Foundation and two organizations funded by them, PATH, which is Program 
for Appropriate Technology in Health, and Gavi, which is Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization, have found themselves under fire after a writ of petition originally submitted to the Supreme Court of India by Kalpana Mehta, Nalini Banot, and Dr. Rukmini Rao in 2012 was finally heard by the courts. The petitioners submitted the following, stating BMGF, PATH, and the World Health Organization were criminally negligent, trialing the vaccines on a vulnerable, uneducated and underinformed population, school administrators, students and their parents who were not provided informed consent or advised of potential adverse effects or required to be monitored post vaccination. There we have it, negligence, and clearly a great concern by those in Indian authority over these vaccination groups. Bill Gates was invited to a TED conference. At the conference, he shared his recommendation on how to address the CO2 problem. The attendees, heard Bill Gates state that we could lower the number of people in the world by 10 or 15 percent. Did you hear that? Listen for yourself. So you've got a thing on the left, CO2, that you want to get to zero, and that's going to be based on the number of people, the services, each person's using on average, the energy on average for each service, and the CO2 being put out uh, per unit of energy. So let's look at each one of these and see how we can get this down to zero. Uh, probably one of these numbers is going to have to get pretty near to zero. Now uh, that's back from high school algebra, but let's, let's take a look. Did you note the nervous laughter? The attendees really did hear what they heard directly from Bill Gates. Listen. Uh, first, we've got population. Uh, the world today has 6.8 billion people. That's headed up to about 9 billion. Now, if we do a really great job on new vaccines, health care, reproductive health services, we could lower that by perhaps 10 or 15 percent. So Bill there you have it. Reducing the world population by 10 or 15 percent. How many millions of people would that be? Is that acceptable to you? You just heard Bill Gates state that the following could be used to address the world population volume. New vaccines, health care, in inverted commas, reproduction services, in other words, abortion clinics. These three strategies have nothing to do with health and the, preser the preservation of good health across the world population. It's about controlling numbers, or to be more specific, reducing the number of people who live in this world. How do you feel about that? The solution to reducing CO2, the equation which equals people times services per person times energy per service times CO2 per unit energy. Is the solution really to reduce the world population? Beloved, do not be deceived. This is a clear vaccination agenda. Bill Gates reveals his family attends Catholic Church. Bill Gates states, the moral systems of religion, I think, are super important. The founder of the Microsoft Empire said in an interview with Rolling Stone magazine, we've raised our kids in a religious way. 
they've gone to the Catholic Church that Melinda goes to his wife and I participate in. Clearly, Bill Gates is an influential Roman Catholic who works clearly and very closely with the Vatican and their agenda. Let me just add a caveat. God loves all of his children, all of his sons and daughters throughout the world, irregardless of the faith we have. God loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. We're all guilty of sin. That's why we need a saviour in Jesus Christ. But whilst there are many sincere, Christ-loving, Catholic members of the church, sadly, there is an elite which call themselves the Jesuits who are working behind the scenes to transform the world. They want a new world order that follows the belief systems of the Roman Catholic Church. They want to uplift Sunday observance as the key day of worship. And according to Revelation 13, this system will cause all to follow, beginning with America and the rest of the countries shall follow like dominoes. Do not be deceived. This is an agenda, not for your health and well-being, but the reverse. The truth is, friends, that many others think just like Bill Gates, they believe that the world population should be reduced. And these people are highly influential, well-known, powerful individuals. And I'm only going to share with you three quotes, but if you search on Google, you'll find many others, part of the worldwide elite, who think in exactly the same way. Here's the first quote. As you can read, it states, I do not pretend that birth control is the only way in which population can be kept from increasing. War, as I remarked a moment ago, has hitherto been disappointing in this respect. But perhaps bacteriological war may prove more effective if a black death could be spread throughout the world once in every generation, survivors could procreate freely without making the world too full. Wow. War was a disappointment. It does make you think, doesn't it? The wars of the past. Were any of these genuine on the outside? Or was there a much more deeper program, a much more deeper strategy designed to simply reduce the world population? This man's name is Bertrand Russell. But there were others. Population control will now become the centerpiece of US foreign policy. Who else is thinking like Bill Gates? Hillary Clinton. If I were reincarnated, I would wish to be returned to Earth as a killer virus to lower human population levels. Who else is thinking like Bill Gates? Prince Philip, also Jewish and the husband of England's Queen Elizabeth. Does that shock you? These are people in prominent view in the world with the most heinous wishes against humanity. Pray for them. Now, this man is called Dr. Lawrence Pilevsky. 
is a paediatrician practicing in Manhattan and on Long Island. And this was recorded on the 22nd of November, 2019. And what I'd like you to do is to listen to what he has to say in regards to vaccines. He will tell you the truth. He is a doctor. He has done his own research, his own study, and he has come with a very clear conclusion. And in contrast to what Bill Gates states, take a listen to this actual doctor, Dr. Lawrence Pilevsky, and what he says about vaccines. In 1983, when I started medical school, I was taught vaccines were safe and they were effective and give them. But I was not taught about any of the science around their safety or any of the studies around how safety were done. And it wasn't until 1998 that a mother came up to me and said, Dr. Larry, did you know that there's mercury in vaccines? And I said, no, I did not. And as a medical student, I was trained to critically think. If you see an observation, you go after it, and try and figure out if there's a question to ask. So instead of just ignoring it, I looked further into the vaccine ingredients. And I found that there were a number of vaccine ingredients that in animal studies were proven to be very dangerous to animals. And I didn't understand why these same ingredients were actually in vaccines. I was starting to hear stories from parents, not dozens, not hundreds, but thousands of stories from parents who took a very healthy child into their doctor's office and then found that their child lost much of their health, whether it was their speech, whether it was seizures, whether it was death, whether it was asthma, allergies, eczema, whether it was autism, whether it was learning disabilities, whether it was inflammatory bowel disease, autoimmune diseases. And every one of those parents were told it had nothing to do with the vaccine. Every single one. And this continues today. But yet when I look at the ingredients that are in the vaccines, I have the science to actually explain how these medical problems could be happening in these children. Today, one in, chi one in child in five is learning disabled. In 1976, it was one in 17. One in six under age eight, one in two adolescents, and one in four young adults is diagnosed with a mental, behavioral, or emotional disorder. One in 20 children under the age of five have seizures. One in child in 40 develops autism. I hope you heard every word of that. The doctor stated that the vaccines had a direct relationship with children experiencing loss of general health loss of speech, seizures, asthma, allergies, eczema, learning disabilities, inflammatory bowel disease, autoimmune disease, autism, and death. How do you feel about that? You see, there are things that are changing in the world today you need to be aware of. You need to open the word of God and study for yourself what will happen in the very near future. Access a Bible and especially study who Jesus Christ is. And then take that same Bible and read the book of Daniel and Revelation to understand where the world is heading. You see, whilst we slept last Friday night, Trump declares Sunday the 15th of March, which is today, a national day of prayer due to coronavirus. Just keep a note of that. A national day. A national day. 
Trump declares Sunday as a national day of prayer amid coronavirus crisis. Why Sunday? Why we keep hearing this? A national day typically falling on a Sunday. Trump tweeted, we are a country that throughout our history has looked to God for protection and strength in times like these. It is my great honor to declare Sunday, March the 15th, as a national day of prayer. You see, there was a writer inspired of God who wrote the book, Great Controversy. And between pages 589 to 592, she states, it will be declared that men are offending God by the violation of the Sunday Sabbath. Let me stop there. Many Christians believe that we should observe Sunday as the Sabbath, the day of rest. But did you know that if you were to comb through the Bible between Genesis and Revelation, you will not find one scripture that supports this. On the contrary, you'll find that Sunday is regarded by God just as another labor day, the first day of a new week. And in fact, if you study the history, you'll find out that Sunday was regarded as a high day for those who were part of pagan kingdoms and pagan groups. You'll find Sunday keeping in pagan Rome. You'll find Sunday keeping in the Greek kingdom. You'll find Sunday keeping under the Medes and the Persians. And you'll find Sunday observance in the Babylonian kingdom because the pagans of old worshiped the sun. They believed that the sun had power and that, as it were, that the sun was indeed God. But friends, why are we worshipping something which is created? Why don't we just simply worship the creator direct? Sunday is not the Sabbath. Jesus Christ never mentioned Sunday as a Sabbath. Neither did his disciples. Neither did any of the patriarchs of old. Sunday is simply the first day of a new week. It's a Labor Day. Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. These are just Labor Days. But if you look at Genesis chapter 2 verses 1 to 3, it clearly states that on the seventh day, God rested. And that's the day that God blessed and sanctified. And guess what? God has never changed it. And in fact, if you look in the book of Revelations, chapter 22, the Bible says, blessed are they that keep his commandments, for they'll have access to the tree of life. At the end of the day, beloved, study your Bibles for yourselves. There's a system that's increasingly putting pressure on people to recognize Sunday as the Sabbath as opposed to the seventh day. Look at Exodus chapter 20, verses eight to 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Which day is that? It's the same day that Adam and Eve observed. And notice Adam and Eve were not Jewish. The Jews didn't come in at that point. Adam and Eve were simply the son and daughter of God. And they kept Sabbath, remembering that the six days in which this world was created, began with an evening, then finished with the morning, i.e. from sunset, as it were, to sunset. And this is the reason why the seventh day today begins from a Friday sunset and ends on a Saturday sunset. You can find this truth in God's word. But let's read this quote again. It will be declared that men are offending God by the violation of the Sunday Sabbath that this sin has brought calamities which will not cease until Sunday observance shall be strictly enforced. Did you know that? There are many people that don't believe that Sunday is the Sabbath. You may be a Jew, 
or you may be a Seventh-day Adventist who believe what the Bible believes and that's that God blessed and sanctified the seventh day. But notice it states that as we see more and more calamities, gradually more and more the blame will be pointed to those who are not keeping Sunday observance. It goes on. And those who present the claims of the fourth commandment, thus destroying reverence for Sunday, are called what? Troublers of the people, preventing their restoration to divine favour and temporal prosperity. Notice that. They want everybody to keep the Sunday in order to have what? restoration to divine favour and temporal prosperity. Even in free America, rulers and legislators, in order to secure public favour, will yield to the popular demand for a law enforcing Sunday observance. The pressure is long. There are counties or there are states in the USA which have blue laws which support Sunday observance. If you go back in history, um, over a hundred years ago at least, there were Sunday alliances that wanted Sunday to be kept as part of legislation. But what does history tell us when you combine church and state together? Have we forgotten the dark ages? When the church at the time, which was the Roman Catholic Church had full control over church and the state, over government, over legislation. And if you happen to be a Protestant, if you happen to be someone that believed in the infallible word of God, you were tortured or you were killed. There was no negotiation. The courts would lead tens of millions of innocent Christians who loved Jesus, who believed that the word has come from the living God who believed that in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. John 1, 1 and 2. Such Christians were killed. People who are listening, if you look at Revelation 13, verses 11 to 18, the scenes and the events of the past are going to be repeated because we have failed to learn that no faith group has the right to enforce its will upon another. When will we learn from history? Friends, all we can do is finish on a high note, a positive note by looking at the most wonderful Psalms 91 verses 1 to 60. The Bible says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome Pestilence. Are we seeing pestilence, disease today? He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness. Are we seeing pestilence spreading across the world? nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. How many people are going to fall? What are we seeing in the world today? Wake up. If you never believed the Bible before, believe it now. The Bible says in verse 7 of Psalms 91, a thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand. 
at this point in the calendar, there is at least 5,000 people that we are told have died of the coronavirus. But there will be many other thousands. God foresaw this. A thousand shall fall at thy side and 10,000 at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Praise God. Only with thine eyes shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall what? Any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Praise the Lord. For he shall give his angels charge over thee, thank you, Jesus, to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. Is the world in trouble, beloved? I will deliver him and honour him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen. My hope, my prayer for you, is that you will see the Almighty as being no other than God. That you'll see that the Almighty is Jesus Christ. He is the one under whom we should find protection. Under his spiritual wings, God will protect, God will sustain, God will lead and God will guide. Just like he did with the children of Israel that followed the cloud by day and a fiery pillar by night. Do you know who was in that cloud? According to 1 Corinthians Chapter 10, verses 1 to 4. That cloud, in that cloud, was no other than the spiritual rock, Jesus Christ. It was Jesus Christ that led the children of Israel from out of Egypt through the wilderness. The children of Israel were in the wilderness for 40 years, but still Jesus led them into Canaan. It's Jesus that has led the light of truth from that time all the way through the early generations, early Christians, and to our day. It is Christ who is leading. That same Jesus who died on a cross is the same Jesus that ascended into heaven to become our priest. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, My little children, I write unto you that you sin not. But if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Jesus is righteous. Psalms 119 verse 172 says, Thy commandments are righteousness. Do you know why? Because when you look at the Ten Commandments, you can only see the character of God through Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't come to destroy, but to fulfill. Jesus is the living example of the Ten Commandments, which is why Jesus said in the book of John, if you love me, keep my commandments. The Bible says that we should repent and be converted, that our sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus. Now is a time to repent. Now is a time to be converted. Now is a time to receive the outpouring of the latter rain or the refreshing. Very soon it will be the time that we will see our God, our Lord, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, face to face. Beloved, remain under the shadow 
of the Almighty. God bless you.